The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our second speaker today is uh, Dale Berner. He's president of the uh, Ben C. Gerwick Incorporated Company. Um, he's going to talk to us today about material requirements. And he's a PhD in construction engineering from UC Berkeley and has over 29 years of experience in working with Gerwick since 1983, working on challenging marine concrete res uh, related projects. He's uh, focused on marine engineering, including design and construction of locks, dams, immersed tubes, storm surge, and salinity barriers, offshore oil and gas platforms, onshore and offshore containment for LNG. Well, thank you all for coming so early. Uh, my PhD was in uh, LNG containment using pre-stressed concrete, so I did a lot of material testing, so I did have a number of papers out there. So we'll just move right ahead. As uh, Charles did uh, indicate that this code is a little bit different than some of the ACI codes. So it's quite common for the industry being designed build. But uh, many of the uh, sections, it's a fully integrated code. So you might have to get familiar with the minimum performance requirements in chapter six. Uh, there are some concrete material properties there, and then there's also the, the uh, construction requirements that also have something to do with the concrete controls. But uh, we'll just be talking about Chapter 4 here, which does provide reference to those other sections. And it not only covers materials, but also it covers the testing requirements, because it is kind of a design-build EPC type of, a, of an approach. So it provides standards for minimum performance, but if you want to do testing uh, to pre-qualify your materials, it, it tells you how to do that. Again, uh, so this is the overview of the presentation. We'll first talk about some of the tests for materials, uh, cementitious materials, aggregates, then uh, water, uh, admixtures, fibers, deformed reinforcement. Uh, we also have uh, plate steel, sometimes composite with the concrete. So as uh, Charles said, this is a, a comprehensive type of a code. So it's not strictly limited only to concrete, but it also makes references out to other codes that are relevant for uh, related materials including non-structural uh, non uh, liners, uh, insulation, and coatings. So that's what the code does cover. As I said, uh, the testing shall conform with applicable codes uh, that are relevant and uh, subject to the approval of the engineers. So normally with these types of projects, there's uh, specifications that are project specific and they can be applied in different countries, so you have to apply to the local requirement codes. Uh, but since this is an ACI code, it is uh, more weighted towards uh, ACI or ASTM requirements, although there are a number of uh, references to European and, and other standards around the world, which are also recognized as being comparable. So we'll move on to this. Uh, there's also uh, heavy requirements for the, uh, or, or good requirements for documentation control. 
certainly as uh, the construction process goes on, it is important to maintain full records of, of what you're doing and maintain them for two years afterwards because it does matter with a concrete construction, the history of how it was constructed. Uh, there's a number of time-dependent properties of concrete. There's interactions with the foundations. And all of those, uh, not to mention quality control, all of those documents need to be kept on record as, and that, that's specified in this section. Tests performed at low temperatures uh, can have significant, can significantly influence the properties. That said, uh, most of the uh, properties of concrete uh, are, are generally are controlled at the uh, ambient temperature. Uh, concrete tends to improve strength, and most of its engineering properties are, are improved at cryogenic temperatures. It's already brittle, so it's already depending on the steel pre-stressing or reinforcement for whatever ductility is required. So most of the concrete properties that are controlling design are frequently controlled at ambient temperature. When you're pre-stressing the operation, that can proof load the concrete properties, uh, prove its, its strength uh, before you get to low temperature. But uh, that said, uh, also the history of the specimen, the cooling and the, the heating can become important because that can control and influence the moisture content of the concrete as well. And the moisture concrete can uh, influence many of the cyclic fatigue properties. It can uh, affect the permeability. It can affect the, uh, the heat of hydration, or the, the thermal conductivity, the specific heat properties. So it is important to uh, understand the history of the specimen, not only in service, but also during the construction. Uh, it also, there are time-dependent properties of uh, the rate at which you heat and cool can influence the thermal gradients through the walls, and, and that can have an influence, again, on, on the crack history of, of the structure. Uh, and again, uh, there are a variety of temperature ranges uh, for different components. Although the primary emphasis is to have a, a steel primary containment tank, this code does allow for a, a concrete primary containment tank. And so that would have a different temperature range than the secondary containment. And there's also with the RLG, you have a variety of different products that are going to be used at different temperature ranges, all of which influence the properties of all the materials that are involved. Again, uh, here the, uh, for the steel and pre-stressing, they, they are less dependent on the thermal history than the concrete is. However, care should be uh, considered, especially when you're considering massive steel specimens, because there there can be residual uh, welding uh, stress gradients that have to be stress relieved and other properties that have to be considered as far as the construction of the size. In general, people are trying to use thinner and thinner steel plates uh, to get rid of some of those residual stresses. So uh, again, uh, regarding cementitious material properties, uh, we do make reference largely to ACI 350, which is, as uh, Charles said, a containment tank. But there are special considerations for LNG. I won't go into every particular detail, but it, it is largely to be said that for the quality control, the ambient temperatures do dominate that for this design. So if you can do it at uh, good quality control for ambient uh, properties, uh, that's what would be required for you to do this type of design here. Uh, there are special considerations. Some people allow primary containment tanks without a liner on them, and then there's uh, special considerations for impermeability, and those specifications are allowed as how impermeable it is, and that's a bit of a specialty for low temperature properties. But nothing totally out of the usual. There are a number of outstanding papers for special tests at cryogenic properties when and where they are required. And there's uh, extensive references provided inside of the document. Again, uh, 
aggregates are an important consideration for uh, for RLG containment tanks. Uh, it's not very common to to be using lightweight concrete, although lightweight concrete uh, does have good properties at low temperatures. It's generally that the standard weight concrete is a more cost competitive. But for considerations where uh, some of the better quality aggregates may be uh, used up, uh, it can be, you can sometimes blend lightweight aggregates together with standard weight aggregates. There may not be a lot of documentation out there yet. But uh, I have done some preliminary tests that indicate that when you blend them together, uh, the, the structural properties remain very favorable and uh, all of the other design properties are well controlled. So if you have that need, you can consider it and it's allowed by the code. Again, uh, there are a number of requirements for cracking, thermal conductivity, and permeability. Some of those are given in the performance requirements. So they might not find all of those inside of Chapter 5. You might have to go to Chapter 6 for some of those performance requirements. Uh, aggregates, uh, you have to think a lot about thermal contraction and expansion frequently when you're uh, designing structures like this. So thermal compatibility is, a, is a, something that's more important for a cryogenic containment and that can have, the aggregate can have uh, an important influence on that. So you need to think about that with your aggregate selection. Uh, again, uh, water quality, there's nothing particularly special here. Often you get into a remote site where water is, uh, high quality water is not totally available, but for mixing with the concrete it has to be essentially a potable water. You can't be using brackish water. Uh, regarding admixtures, again, there is nothing uh, particularly special about this. Uh, all of these uh, standard uh, ASTM tests uh, are appropriate. Uh, they're all of the air entrainment, uh, workability compatibility, uh, chloride uh, or corrosion control considerations. Uh, all of those are addressed inside of this chapter and they are what you would be expecting for uh, ambient temperature design considerations. All of the admixtures are for controlling the uh, you know, the workability, the fresh properties of the concrete, so cryogenic considerations are not uh, dominant there. Fibers, most LNG or containment tanks don't use extensive use of fibers, but uh, in specialty considerations they, they can have benefit and, and they can uh, help with uh, requirements as they might occur, so you, you can make it with uh, reinforced concrete or shotcrete can be applied to the outside. Certainly the fibers can improve the uh, compressive ductility, the tensile ductility, uh, the shear strength and ductility, crack control and fatigue resistance. It's a bit of a speciality but uh, polypropylene or other synthetic fibers can resist, it can improve the fire resistance. Uh, those types of fibers can turn into ash under high temperatures which can allow the, the steam that can occur inside of the concrete to vent without uh, with minimal amount of spalling which might otherwise occur. So if there are some unusual requirements there, typically if you have a dry enough concrete, air dry concrete, uh, then the steam generation may not be as much of a problem. Uh, with regard to deformed reinforcing or mild reinforcing, uh, uh, the code, the, the provisional code that's out does uh, allow that down to minus, uh, uh, down to zero degrees Fahrenheit uh, in, in our session earlier. Uh, we did vote uh, for the next code that's coming out to allow that down to minus four degrees Fahrenheit or minus 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, certainly uh, in Europe, uh, uh, some of the fundamental codes allow those steels to go down to minus 40 degrees without special provisions. But here, uh, uh, by, uh, it is a common tradition to use ASTM A615, 
there are higher grades now uh, in the code that's out. It, it limits it to requiring that you use grade 60. There are grade uh, 75 and 80. And the next uh, version of that, uh, you'll be permitted to use those higher grades. But I don't believe they'll give you much economic advantage. So uh, that's a bit of a formality. You can also use BS449 types of steel. Uh, so the concrete uh, exponents uh, note below are uh, in Fahrenheit. Uh, there's accidental uh, conditions you have to consider for for these. What, these temperature ranges are for in service. So when you have an accidental case, well then there are other uh, sections that uh, consider uh, uh, lower temperatures. And then those are, are broken out under a different section heading. Temporary stresses during construction are considered. Uh, concrete components exposed to service or, or, or cryogenic temperature conditions do not uh, exceed the next slide here. So, again, as I said, uh, under service conditions, uh, we have this limit for mild reinforcing steel of, of zero degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and those steels, uh, there, there are three possible areas that, that uh, can qualify the mild reinforcing steel. There's A, B, and C. So this first section for carbon steels is a stress limit. So you can qualify your steel by just limiting the stress in your rebars to these relatively low levels. It's to ensure that you uh, don't have to require a ductile type of uh, performance. Uh, this, this is essentially like a working stress type of an approach. And this, these loads, these stress levels are compatible with NFPA 59.8. Now, uh, you, uh, if you want to meet uh, this uh, Euro code requirement, 14620, uh, you can submit uh, and document uh, test results for your materials for, for, for other mild reinforcing steel. So if you have European grades of steel and you want to submit those for your use, you just submit the documentation that's compliant with these tests and, and then you can proceed with using those materials. Uh, there are quite a, a variety of uh, proprietary projects out there. Some of them are stress controlled. Some of them are have different chemical compositions. Some of them just have higher quality control. Those are all recognized and permitted here. Uh, general effects of low service temperatures on non-pre-stress reinforcement is, is to increase the yield and, and the tensile strength and reduce the, the ductility and the fracture strength. So selection of the reinforcing should take that into account. That's why in the option A, we limit the stress because we can't quite guarantee the ductility. But uh, if you do have lower ductility requirements, you can achieve those by allowing these. This uh, section C is for allowing austenitic stainless steel, which has good ductility properties. So you can meet those requirements. You don't have to do any testing. You just use those formulations if that's the approach you, you want to use in your design. Uh, again, with uh, it, since we have a comprehensive code, we also cover the plate steel. Although, uh, so sometimes those can be uh, independent uh, of, of the concrete or, or they can be made composite. They can either be structural or non-structural in those regards. Uh, but, as I said, we, we do make reference back to the material section, back to API 620, and we are in the process of, of remaining in sync with their changes uh, as, as the years develop here. So with pre-stressing reinforcement, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, pre-stressed steel is a cryogenic grade of material. Uh, when, during the process of forming it, it tends to uh, get rid of some of the microstructure inside of the con inside of the steel that uh, can make it less uh, less brittle or make it more brittle. I mean to say, so it is uh, it is a cryogenic grade of material pre-stressing strands. Uh, we allow uh, circumferential wrapping here, or we allow a post post tensioning approach uh, with grouting.
Uh, we also cover anchorages uh, are specified here, what type of requirements are allowed for the anchorages, uh, cover the plates and the anchor heads and the wedges. Uh, other materials besides steel, such as cast iron, are, are permitted. Uh, we also have requirements as far as uh, ducts that uh, might be in there and the grouting requirements that would be required for, for post-tensioning processes. Uh, and uh, most of those are again covered under uh, section 11 for which is more of a construction consideration there. Uh, with uh, metal liners and non-structural metallic components, uh, as I said, it is possible for the metal liner to act compositely with the structure, and uh, in which case uh, there are requirements for stress limitations on those, uh, and this bonding, the studs that are required to, for it to behave uh, compositely with the structure. There are uh, uh, thermal corner protection liners that uh, have to deal with stresses, and, and those have uh, certain uh, chemical composition requirements. Uh, those would be a non-structural type of a barrier. And uh, in general, again, we refer back to uh, API 620 uh, for the primary and secondary components that are embedded. There's also roof uh, plate considerations uh, with the uh, non-structural barriers. Uh, we have to have uh, consideration both for uh, water vapor and for product vapor. So, so there's a number of liners that are considered in there and, and they can also be coatings as well as uh, metallic components. Uh, again, we, we do make references for insulation, but uh, since we are a code and we are a mandatory code and uh, we feel that insulation is a key component to the actual performance of the uh, containment structure, we do use mandatory language for the types of, uh, of insulation that can be used, but we then also make references to the specifications that are required in another relevant existing proven uh, codes. So we are we subdivided into load bearing considerations, which have a higher thermal conduct conductivity. Uh, we have uh, those are normally in the base, under the walls, and in the floors. Uh, the LNG, although it's relatively light, uh, it, we have very high heads, so those load bearing considerations are considered. This goes in. Uh, in direction from a higher thermal conductivity down to lower thermal conductivity. There's different price considerations and performance and, and guidance is given on that in the code as well. The, these are the uh, non-load bearing uh, types of materials uh, for insulation. Uh, the highest conductivity again is at the top with perlite, uh, foamed plastics, fiberglass, uh, material, mineral wool, polyurethane, and composite materials. And uh, of course, uh, as I said, coatings are, are covered under uh, Chapter 6, which is uh, minimum performance requirements. There are a number of different types of, uh, of uh, coatings that are proprietary out there. So rather than being prescriptive about what can and can't be, there's a very dynamic market out there. As I said, this is a, more of an EPC or design build type of an approach. So we cover those under uh, Chapter 6 along with several other uh, concrete properties, including uh, the stiffness properties and some of the strength requirements, minimum strength requirements are covered there. So in conclusions, um, this is the temperature range of, for service. Uh, ambient temperatures can exceed this range, which is another consideration. You, know, you go up into Canada or Alaska, uh, temperatures can drop down to minus 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, which may exceed this temperature range, but the code is still applies. This is uh, so many of these requirements for service operations, you'd have to meet those other durability requirements according to the local codes and the environment that you're in. 
Uh, we also cite the, the testing standards uh, and give you references on how to meet those uh, requirements and uh, literature guidance on, on where to find tests that uh, could meet the standard. But there is an emphasis given on the engineer and, and on the project uh, specifications uh, as far as what is an acceptable test. So that's the end of my presentation. Are there questions? Uh, you mentioned about fiber in cross country. Uh, has the coordinating requirement on volume of fiber? I don't think that it's that prescriptive. It, it gives more of a performance type of requirements as far as the fibers. Uh, so in, in that regard, then it's up to the engineer to specify why it is that he needs it, what performance type of uh, behavior he's trying to achieve with it. And then there's references other to, to other uh, requirements that specify how to achieve that. But in general, uh, those types of properties are for ductility, which is just a load case. Uh, as I said, most of the properties of the concrete and the steel are enhanced at low temperature. So when you design to meet it at ambient temperature, the, you, outside of the questions of expansion and compatibility and durability, it's not so much of an issue. Is there another question in the back? As far as you know, uh, the behavior of concrete low temperature has been sufficiently investigated in the past or there are still open problems. Well, of course, there's always advances in concrete technology. It's a, it's a never-ending process. Uh, certainly, there are tanks in operation. There are primary containment tanks in operation for concrete, and there's secondary with service histories, uh, as uh, Charles should go back to the 50s and probably back to the 40s for, for that consideration for secondary containment tanks. But uh, as far as uh, new technology that's coming up with new thinner walls, uh, different ways of controlling creep, of course there's always research that's ongoing. Uh, there's uh, always questions about uh, what is acceptable performance criteria. Just as an example with permeability, uh, there are people who would just like to use a, a concrete uh, primary containment tank without a liner on it, on the primary face and just rely on the low permeability. Now, certainly there are a lot of different ways of achieving low permeability concrete. Uh, some of it is by changing the aggregate types and formulations. Uh, there's uh, things that have to do with the history and the stress concentrations at joints and whether you allow sliding joints and then how do you achieve and guarantee the sliding joints. So in that sense, uh, this is a comprehensive mandatory code that uh, considers the construction and then the performance operations. So we found it impossible to, to separate out those considerations from the material properties. So if you have a certain type of performance you want to achieve, whether it's small minimizing micro cracks for the permeability, because certainly if you have cracks, then permeability doesn't mean too much, so you have to avoid that, or you have to provide a liner to, to guarantee it. And then there are a number of joint industry studies that have been out there that have test programs associated with them. Uh, I guess you'd have to then, many of them are sponsored by either users or, or operators or, or, or contractors, so uh, those types of questions are out there, yes. More questions? Well, as, as I said, uh, mostly the designs are dominated by ambient temperatures, so I guess most of the reason that you would want to be using the, uh, the fibers would be for, say, an accidental load case, so whether that uh, would be a fire or whether it would be a cryogenic conditions. In general, uh, you know, I guess, you know, as I said, that there are steel fibers, and, and in those cases, the steel fibers are bonded fully with the, with the cement matrix. Uh, and the thermal uh, uh, 
coefficient of expansion and contraction of steel and concrete typically are very relatively close to each other, but the, the steel tends to be a little bit higher, so it tends to shrink a little bit more. So at, say at cryogenic temperatures, it would have the tendency to put the concrete a little bit more to pre-compress it. So you would think that would be a benefit, but most of the requirements don't allow you to take advantage of those benefits uh, in, in your design. Of course, a lot of the considerations come down to workability as well as, as documenting that it's been consolidated appropriately, and, and that comes down into the questions about are there prescriptive requirements for uh, you know, percentages of densities of the, of the fiber reinforcement, and, and no, we, we don't give specific guidance like that. You'd have to provide your own results and, and document what it is you're trying to achieve with it. So it's permitted, but, but there isn't a lot of tests that are referenced inside of this code. All right.